Hey, good morning, neighborhood. How are we doing today? Oh, someone's doing great. I love that. Someone loves that it's fall. How many of you guys, fall is your favorite time of year? Let's see those hands. Praise the Lord. Summer folks, you're done. It's time for fall. I've got my boots on. I don't care if it's 90 degrees next week. I'm wearing flannels because fall is here. Hey, as Lauren said, today we're going to be wrapping up our teaching series, How to Get Unstuck. And I want to open up our conversation with a story about a young man named Aaron Ralston. Now, Aaron loved the outdoors, loved hiking, camping, mountaineering. But one day, Aaron got stuck in a very, very major way. Back in 2003, he was hiking alone in Blue John Canyon in Utah, making his way through a series of slot canyons. Now, slot canyons are these beautiful, very deep, very narrow rock formations. They're fun to explore, but they can also be incredibly dangerous. At one point, Aaron began climbing down a boulder suspended in the canyon. When it began to shift, And then it fell, crushing his right hand and pinning him to the canyon walls. In the blink of an eye, Aaron was trapped. His hand was shattered. And to make matters worse, he didn't have a cell phone. Also, he had not notified any friends or family that he would be hiking alone that day. So he was completely isolated, completely stuck with no way to call for help. Now, Aaron remained stuck in the canyon. Go ahead and throw his picture back up there. He remained stuck like that in the canyon for five days. Five days with a crushed arm. Five days with only 12 ounces of water to sustain him. Five days of of desperately pulling and, and pushing and trying to move this boulder, but to no avail. Aaron was exhausted began hallucinating, and as you can imagine, he began to lose hope. In his autobiography, he says that he actually had a camera in his backpack, and he began recording farewell messages to his friends and family because he thought he would never get unstuck. But it was at that point after five days, when Aaron Ralston was about to give up, starving to death, completely stuck in that canyon, that he did the unthinkable. In his backpack, he had a small multi-tool, and on that multi-tool was a two-inch pocket knife. And over the course of an hour, he amputated his own arm to get himself free from this boulder. Tiny little pocket knife. One hour, can you even begin to imagine? But desperate times call for desperate measures. So, Aaron gets unstuck, and then he hikes out of the canyon He repels 65 feet down a sheer rock wall and hikes six miles back to his car. By the time he ran into other hikers, he had lost 40 pounds over the past five days and almost 25% of his blood volume. He was airlifted to safety and miraculously survived this ordeal. Aaron wrote his story in a book and began to travel around Uh, sharing with the media, sharing the world this amazing yet horrific story of his. And in 2010, it was adapted into a movie called 127 Hours, starring James Franco, directed by Danny Boyle. And this film went on to be nominated for numerous Academy Awards. And and this is understandable, right? It's, It's an incredible story. It's a horrific story, but against all odds, completely trapped and helpless, Aaron Ralston found a way to get unstuck. Now, hopefully none of us ever have to go through something like that, right? We might not ever be trapped in a desperate situation like this, but there are still times in life that we feel stuck. There are times where this feels like a metaphor for our life experience. We're pinned down, we're crushed, we're stuck, and we can't move. We feel trapped, we feel isolated, Sometimes it seems like we can't make any progress no matter how hard we push, pull, or struggle. We get stuck in our financial situations, stuck in our marriages and relationships, stuck in our mental health. I mean, if life, picture this, if life is like one big road trip, there's many seasons where we feel stuck on the side of the road with a blown out tire, 
a busted transmission, and an empty tank. We get stuck in toxic thought loops, addictive behaviors, destructive habits, or sometimes it's not dramatic, right? Life just kind of slows down and we plateau. We stop making progress. We stop growing. There's so many different ways to get stuck in life, but thankfully we believe there's hope. And as an added bonus, you don't have to cut off your arm with a pocket knife to get unstuck because at Neighborhood Church, we believe Jesus can help us get unstuck. Jesus can help us move life forward. We believe Jesus is the key to human flourishing, and this is so much more than religion. Jesus' way of love, his his wisdom, it all shows us the way life is meant to be lived. Jesus is a living, breathing, walking, talking expression of God's divine love. He shows us how life is meant to be lived, how this world was created to be. So Christianity, it's more than religion. It's more than Sunday mornings. It's this radical invitation. It's this call to action. It's a call to follow Jesus, not just intellectually, but with our entire being. It's the decision to orient our entire lives around Jesus' teachings, character, and mission. It's the choice to be with Jesus, to be like Jesus, and do the things he did. We believe walking with Jesus is the key to getting unstuck and moving life forward. And and listen, it's not going to be an overnight thing. There's no simple solutions to the complicated issues we face in life. But when we choose to orient our lives around Jesus' love and wisdom and justice, it puts gas in our tank. It puts wind in our sails. It picks us up and dusts us off and sends us on our way. His ways propel us into God's plan and purpose for our life. Jesus helps us become the best version of ourselves, the the types of people God has created us to be. And that's exactly what we've been discussing this month in this series, How to Get Unstuck. And so today, as I have the pleasure of wrapping this thing up, I thought we'd have a conversation about discontentment. I think it's really easy to get stuck in discontent, stuck in restlessness, stuck in resentment, stuck in jealousy. Listen to this. Discontentment is a state of dissatisfaction or unhappiness with one's current situation or circumstances. It can manifest as restlessness, frustration, or a feeling that something is lacking or not right in one's life. I think we can all relate to this at one point or another, right? Times we feel discontent in our jobs, times we feel discontent in our friendships or marriage. We're discontent with our finances, our our life prospects in general. Discontentment is when you have this tape playing on loop in your head over and over again that just says, I'm not where I want to be. I'm not where I want to be. I'm not where I want to be. It's buying into that old cliche that the grass is greener on the other side. And so many people jump from job to job and city to city looking for that perfect career. Or people jump from church to church and denomination to denomination looking for that perfect faith community. Some people jump from relationship to relationship and marriage to marriage looking for that perfect romance. But sooner or later we start to realize that life isn't perfect. And at some point we have to stop critiquing the world around us and trying to control our environments and instead look inward. Most of my 20s was uh, defined by chronic discontentment. I, I would stay at jobs for about a year, two years at the most. We moved around a lot. No matter what, I just couldn't find contentment. And I remember my mom said to me one time, in fact, she probably said this a couple of times, very lovingly, great advice. She said this, hey, Jordan, just remember, wherever you go, there you are, Right? means wherever you go, 
You're still going to bring your baggage with you. You can jump from job to job. You can jump from marriage to marriage. You can jump from church to church. But unless you understand the inner source of your discontent, nothing you do, nothing you change, no other person is going to scratch that itch on your soul. And I think this is an important conversation for us today because we live in a culture of discontentment. Let's just be honest. Let's be candid this morning. Modern culture, right, we're kind of spoiled, aren't we? We're a little bit spoiled. Not many of us ever have to go without food or shelter or the basic necessities of life. Compared to most of human history, and even compared to the rest of the globe, even the most low-income Americans live like kings and queens, comparatively speaking. We have running water, electricity, security, public services, education, transportation, entertainment, and yet it just feels like it's not enough. It doesn't satisfy us. We're not content with our house because it's too small. It's too outdated. We're not content with our technology. We have the iPhone 72 instead of the iPhone 73 X plus max. Uh, we're not content with our kids' school, right? We're not content with the programs and extracurricular activities. Or, or how come at this school, uh, on the other side of town, they have these programs and my kids' school doesn't, right? We're not content. Compared to the rest of human history and the rest of the world, we live in this unprecedented age of peace and prosperity, and yet just go on Instagram or Facebook, and you would think we're living in an apocalyptic wasteland by the amount of grumbling you see. And in a way, American society is, is built on a foundation of discontent, right? That's what fuels consumerism, right? Uh, listen to this. The average American home has more than 300,000 items in it. That is twice as much. We consume twice as much as we did just 50 years ago. I also thought this was interesting. The average home has tripled in size over the last 50 years. And yet it's not enough. So we start living outside of our means. We strap ourselves down with debt because we don't know how to be content. We get stuck in discontentment. And as the author Eckhart Tolle once wrote, discontent, blaming, complaining, and self-pity cannot serve as a foundation for a good future, no matter how much effort you make. Now, I want to be clear this morning. Some discontentment is good. Some discontentment is good. There's healthy discontent and unhealthy discontent. If we're feeling restless because we want to grow, we want to get better, that's a good thing. Sometimes when we feel that gnawing urge inside to be a better parent, to be a better friend, spouse, or follower of Jesus, that's great, and we should respond to that. And many times, that's what it sounds like when God is speaking to us, and his spirit is moving within us, urging us, challenging us, growing us. If you're here today and you're feeling discontent because you're stuck in old mindsets or attitudes or habits, by all means, explore those feelings. Act on those urges. I also think discontent is healthy when it comes from our relationship with Jesus, meaning we should be discontent with the brokenness of the world around us. We shouldn't be comfortable when we see human suffering. We shouldn't be comfortable when we see injustice. That's good discontentment. That, that is an emotion that spurs us into meaningful action. But that's typically not where we get stuck. Instead, we get stuck in unhealthy discontentment that leads not to action, but to resentment. We resent others around us we can resent God for not giving us the life we feel we deserve, and ultimately we resent ourselves. And this type of chronic discontent can lead to very destructive behaviors. This is uh, articulated quite beautifully by James. He was uh, one of the early leaders in the Christian church in the first century. He was the half-brother of Jesus. And in one of his letters, he wrote this to the early Christians. He said, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. 
You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God, but when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. I mean, James is coming out here swinging, right? He's on a soapbox. But don't we see this in our culture over and over again? Isn't this the root of so much dysfunction in our world today? This is where wars begin. This is where infidelity in marriages begin. This is what tears apart friendships and ruins workplaces. This is the root of exploitation and abuse of others. You might put it this way. Getting stuck in unhealthy discontentment leads to chronic resentment, which results in destructive conflict. It's a bit of a slippery slope. When we're continually discontent, it leads to resentment, which leads in destructive behaviors and conflict. And this conversation reminds me of the story we've been exploring in the Old Testament this month. Throughout this series, we've been looking in the book of Exodus at the story of Israel. Israel was stuck in slavery in Egypt for hundreds of years until God miraculously liberated them from their chains and led them into freedom. And as we've been seeing and discussing, this story is an amazing example and expression of God's redemptive plans for our world. God is making all things new. God is liberating us from the chains that bind us and bringing us into freedom in new life. But as we've been studying, even though God was faithful, rescued them from slavery, brought them towards the promised land, there were many speed bumps along the way. As I mentioned last week, Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years before settling in the promised land. And the journey was difficult, and they constantly complained. They complained to their leader, Moses, and his brother Aaron. And they wanted to go back to Egypt. They were uncomfortable. They were suspicious. They didn't trust God. And so they complained and grumbled and said, you know what, let's go back to what's familiar. Let's go back to what's comfortable the chains of slavery in Egypt. Here's what we read today. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us into this desert to starve the entire assembly to death. So Moses goes to God on behalf of the complaining Israelites. And he has a conversation. Now keep in mind, at this point, God had worked supernatural miracles to free Israel. He had split the Red Sea in two. He had shown up in major ways, proving himself faithful time and time again. And yet, his people still didn't trust that he had a plan for them. And yet, in spite of their grumbling, God promises to feed Israel the Israelites, to take care of their needs, to have compassion on them. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. God says, even though I've already showed up in so many ways, even though I've rescued these people Uh, Even though they're grumbling, I'm going to continue to care for them. I'm going to continue to show up and prove my love. And that's exactly what he does. That evening, quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer, which is about two liters, for each person you have in your tent. Even in the wasteland, even in the wilderness, even when they feel stuck, God showed up to take care of Israel's needs. And maybe he didn't give them everything they wanted, but they certainly got everything they needed to continue their journey. So it's a miracle. They wake up and and breakfast is served. This, This bread, this manna as they called it. 
But it's not long before the Israelites start grumbling again. They start taking God for granted. They're pulled back into the orbit of discontent. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. Apparently God's miraculous gift of of quail and manna wasn't enough. What was once miraculous one day was taken for granted the next. No matter how many times God blessed his people, they were fixated on the idea that they were getting a raw deal. And this is true in our lives too, right? We go from miracle to misery in the blink of an eye. I'll never forget about 10 years ago, I was in my mid-20s. Kara and I literally wept tears of joy when we bought our first little house in Tacoma, Washington. We were so excited to have a place of our own, especially since we were young and we didn't have a lot of money and housing costs in the Northwest were going through the roof. Buying this house felt like a miracle. It felt like an expression of God's blessing in our lives. But ask my wife. Only a couple years later, I could write a book on everything wrong with this house. It was too small. It was old. It wasn't in the best neighborhood. It had single pane windows, so the utilities cost an arm and a leg. It only had one bathroom. It got hot upstairs in the summer. There was no air conditioning. And yes, I mean, those were real issues, but it was funny to see how quickly my attitude shifted from gratitude and blessing to discontentment and resentment. I went from, oh my gosh, I can't believe we have our own house, to, oh my gosh, I can't believe we don't have a better house, in the blink of an eye. You can't enjoy today's blessings when you're obsessed with the idea that something better is around the corner. It's like, um, you ever watch kids open presents on Christmas morning on their birthday when they have way too many presents? What happens? They pick it up, rip it open, look, throw it aside, bring on the next one, right? They're focused on what's next, what's bigger, what's better. This is great, but but I'm ready for what's next. It's discontentment. In the Exodus story, God took care of Israel at every turn and corner, showing up in miraculous ways, and yet it still wasn't enough for them. So they chose to complain rather than to express gratitude. They chose suspicion over trust in God. They were stuck in a rut of discontent. And I think it's easy for us to get stuck in that very same trap. But Jesus wants something so much better for us. Jesus wants to lead us into a lifestyle of contentment, a lifestyle in joy and wonder at the blessings that God showers on us. Um, So how do we tap into that? Especially in this modern culture, this culture of discontent, culture of consumerism, bigger, better, faster, keeping up with the Joneses, the rat race, all that. How do we cultivate contentment? I've got three ideas for you this morning. Three ideas to cultivate contentment. Shift your perspective, quit comparing, and practice gratitude. This isn't rocket science. This is the classic Jordan sermon where I give you three really simple ideas. I think these ideas are simple to understand but difficult to put into practice. If you want to get unstuck from discontentment, if you want to experience the joy of a content life, shift your perspective, quit comparing, and practice gratitude. This isn't just pop psychology. I didn't have chat GBT write these points this week. These ideas are rooted in the wisdom we find in the pages of Scripture and in the way of Jesus. So let's take a look at these one by one. First things first, if you're going to cultivate contentment, you need to shift your perspective. Is your glass half empty or is your glass half full? A little bit of awareness of ourselves and the world around us goes a long way. Think of Israel again. They were freed from slavery, freed from inhuman, uh, inhumane treatment, from chains, from beatings, 
from, from all this work and toil. And God is bringing them through the wilderness towards the promised land. He's bringing them towards their hopes and dreams to this abundant land of, of blessing and joy. And yet, all they can focus on is the negative. Their glass was half empty every step of the way. And, and easily, we can do the same. But when we shift our perspective, we start to realize how good things really are. Or if not that, at least how much worse things could be. For Israel, manna and quail probably wasn't the most thrilling breakfast month after month, but I imagine it was a lot better than working 16 hours a day under the whips and chains of the Egyptian overlords. A bit more perspective would have helped Israel cultivate contentment. I once heard a stand-up comedian years ago describe modern culture this way. He said, everything is amazing and everyone is miserable. Everything's amazing and everyone's miserable. We are more blessed and privileged than any other group of humans throughout history. You know, living in America, sure, we have our issues, uh, but we are so blessed. We have so much to be grateful for. And yet, when you go online, you would think that we live in an apocalyptic wasteland. When you see how people grumble and complain and take our blessings for granted, you would think we live in absolute misery. And I get it, there's valid complaints. Well, Jordan, what about inflation? Jordan, what about gas prices? Jordan, what about wage stagnation? The economy is in the toilet. I get that. I understand that. But when we shift our perspective and look at the big picture, we realize we have a lot to be grateful for. Listen to this fascinating quote. It's from a Swedish historian named Johan Norberg. I think I shared this about a year ago, but I held on to it. It's, it's so fascinating to me. He said this, based on his studies as a historian, despite what we hear on the news and from many authorities, the great story of our era is that we are witnessing the greatest improvement in global living standards ever to take place. Poverty, malnutrition, illiteracy, child labor, and infant mortality are falling faster than at any other time in human history. There's a new story you won't see on TV. There's a new story you won't see on your social media feed. Our world has its challenges, but a little bit of perspective helps us be grateful. Rather than obsessing over what we don't have, Perhaps we should meditate on the things we do have. And that's not to be dismissive to those of you who are going through real struggles right now. Some of you in the room might have recently lost jobs. Maybe you're strapped with debt. You don't know how you're going to pay your bills. Maybe you've got a health diagnosis. Maybe you've got all sorts of real stuff going on. It's not to be dismissive of those things. I get it. Life is challenging. Life is difficult. But even in those dark moments... If we shift our perspective, we can begin to cultivate contentment wherever we are and wherever we go. Listen, I've seen young people, their teens and 20s, they have their health, they have all the world's information at their fingertips, they have all the opportunities in the world, they have money, they have food, shelter, all these things, education, and they're absolutely miserable but I've also met people who are suffering with stage four cancer, who are more joyful, who are more content, who are more grateful than anyone you've ever met. That's crazy, right? That's illogical. But that's what happens when we shift our perspective. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, trusting in his goodness and love, we can feel blessed even when life is hard. So the first step to cultivating contentment is simply to shift our perspective. Now, the next thing I want to talk about today, we need to quit comparing. To cultivate contentment, we have to quit comparing. And this is hard because social media has given you the tools for endless comparison. Every day we wake up, we open our social media feeds, and we get to see people who have more money than us, people who are better looking than us, people who are smarter, more talented, have better opportunities. 
Their kids are better at sports than our kids are. Their house looks better than ours. All these things, we wake up and compare ourselves to others every single day, and it makes us resentful. It makes us take for granted the gifts we've been given. One of my favorite U.S. presidents was Theodore Roosevelt. I read his biography a few years ago. And he once said that comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison will rob you of joy and satisfaction. We can't cultivate contentment if we're stuck in a jealous funk comparing our lives and our possessions and our capabilities with everyone around us. And this is especially true with social media. And what you got to remember is most of what you're seeing is an illusion. Most of what you see on Instagram and TikTok is fantasy. People go to great lengths to accentuate the good and minimize the bad. I mean, have you ever been to Burger King before? Recently, they built a Burger King right by our house. It's one of the most exciting days of my life. <laughs> can go in my backyard, and if the wind hits just right, I can smell Whoppers. The problem is, when you have a Burger King by your house, is you go a lot. Uh, so it's easy. So I started to feel sick, and my wife started to judge me. So I'm currently on a Burger King sabbatical for the time being. But think about Burger King. You go, or any other fast food restaurant, and you see the posters on the wall and outside, and you see these big, delicious burgers. Oh my gosh, that Whopper looks so amazing. And then you order it. And it looks like somebody stomped on it with a steel toe boot, right? It's an illusion. It's fake. Our culture is filled to the brim with exaggeration, hyperbole, and unrealistic standards. So quit comparing yourself to all the fake stuff you see on social media. Moms, stop comparing yourself to those super moms who kids uh, uh, are never filthy and always behave and they make gourmet dinners and nobody ever yells at each other and cries, right? Stop comparing yourself. That's not real life. Stop comparing yourself to people who are roided out in the gym, you know, bodybuilders who are destroying their bodies. Whatever that looks like for you, stop comparing yourself to others. That's the quickest way to cultivate contentment. We cultivate contentment when we make the decision to quit comparing. Stop looking at your neighbor. Stop trying to keep up with the Joneses. Look at what's in your hands. Look at the blessings you've been given and be thankful for them. And that's the third and final point. To cultivate contentment, we need to practice gratitude. We've done whole sermon series on this. Honestly, it feels like half of the sermons I do practice gratitude is one of the points at the end uh, because it's so crucial and it's so critical for our growth. The Apostle Paul encouraged the earliest Christians to live a lifestyle of radical gratitude. He wrote this, rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, not just the good ones, but in the bad ones. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Gratitude is a mark that you're walking with Jesus. This is how God wants you to live your life, a life of contentment that's built on a foundation of thankfulness and gratitude. So if you've been feeling discontent this weekend, this month, this year, I want to challenge you. When you get home from church today, go home, grab a piece of paper, and spend 10 minutes. Just bullet point things you're grateful for. Just write them down. I think you'll be surprised how long that list gets. And while it may not solve all your problems, it will help you shift your perspective. And it'll help you see things in your life that are worth celebrating. It might even help you see challenges as growth opportunities. Gratitude is a secret sauce. Melody Beatty is an author who once wrote that gratitude makes sense of our past, brings peace for today, and creates a vision for tomorrow. It's a spiritual discipline that strengthens our contentment. And that's what Jesus wants for us. That's how we get unstuck. When we shift our perspective, quit comparing, and practice gratitude, we begin to cultivate contentment, and we get unstuck from resentment, jealousy, and the destructive attitudes and behaviors that come with that. Ultimately, 
as we close this morning, Paul reminds us that we find contentment in Jesus. In every season, in every situation, no matter what, we can find true, lasting contentment in Jesus. By following Jesus, orienting our lives towards him and around his way of love and wisdom, we experience greater joy and fulfillment than we ever thought possible. Paul wrote this, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul is saying, I am most content when I am walking with Jesus. Like we've been saying all month long as we wrap up this series, Jesus is the key to getting unstuck in life. And all we have to do is say yes to his invitation, that invitation to redemption, that invitation to reconciliation with God and each other, that invitation to a new way of living that leads to contentment and joy and peace. It's how we get unstuck and move forward in life. And it's the invitation that we extend every weekend here at Neighborhood Church. No matter who you are, what your story is, or what you even believe, you're invited to come walk with Jesus with us. Stay connected with each other, helping out in our community, growing deep as Jesus leads us. I don't know what you're dealing with this morning. I don't know where exactly you're feeling stuck right now. And I can't tell you all the solutions to your problems. But what I can say with absolute confidence is something we say time and time again here at Neighborhood Church. And that's this, that Jesus makes life better. Let's pray today. Jesus, thank you so much for being our light in the darkness. For teaching us, for growing us. Would you forgive us for all the things we take for granted? Would you forgive us for getting stuck in discontent and and grumbling like the Israelites in the desert, failing to see all the wonderful blessings that you heap upon us, Lord? When life gets tough, Lord, help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to hold on to hope, to shift our perspective in a way that helps us uh, stay joyful and content, even in difficult circumstances. Jesus, we love you, we're grateful for you, and it's in your name we pray, amen.